Hi, my name is Gil Robertson, president of the African American Film Critics Association. Today, we are thrilled to talk to a good friend of AFCA's, uh, the actor, uh, producer, director, creative, a uh, man of all things, Mr. Mo McRae, who is responsible for the upcoming film, A Lot of Nothing. I'm gonna introduce you to the AFCA members on the call today, starting with our facilitator, Katia Woods in Philadelphia, Katia. Nancy Green in Baltimore, Nancy. Jill Monroe in Los Angeles, yeah. Reggie Pounder in Chicago, Reggie. Al McGee in South Florida, and Rhonda yeah. Rasha Penrice in Atlanta, Georgia. Rhonda. I'm gonna let you guys do what you do so well, and I will see you on the other side. Per usual, you killed it, because you're a baller. <laughs> uh, just doing what I do, man. What should I cook tonight? I'm fine with anything. Thank you, that's very helpful. <laughs> you're one of the good ones, brother. We are live on the scene of yet another officer-involved shooting. That man has been identified as Officer Brian Stanley. Our neighbor? Our neighbor. And now we wait for him to be exonerated. So what does one do, Vanessa? I just want us to do something. We gotta take a stand. Now, you're going to come over to our house. I'm going to talk, and you're going to listen. What's your plan? I just want to talk to him. This is by far the dumbest thing you could possibly be doing right now. More tape, baby. I've been seeing a therapist. What? We're stuck in this, this counterproductive cycle. Well, Sheila thinks that that's part of our code. Sheila! And honestly, I'm, I'm starting to of think Of course it's a Sheila. Brother! <laughs> Oh, snap. It's when y'all play piano. Is everything all right with Vanessa? Yeah, she's she all good. The longer this goes on, the worse it gets for you, too. You get off on power. You really are beautiful, you know that. You get off on superiority. Oh, shit. I know you're scared. Crazy job is only one way out of this. No. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, 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 Mo, this is uh, Reggie Pond out of Chicago. I got a chance to uh, talk with you a little bit while you were here in Chicago. I remember, um, good to see you again. Uh, good, great to see you. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, why you didn't cast yourself in this, and uh, I'd like for you to uh, to talk about this, because I, I see you, man. I see you on this. I see you on this. Well, I mean, thank you for that. I, I chose not to cast myself because it was really important to me to focus on telling the story in the most dynamic way possible, putting all my attention and efforts into that. And then honestly, you know, being fortunate enough to cast people like Alain Noel and Shamir Anderson, who were incredible actors and people that just embodied everything. They done the job that I would have dreamt of doing. Like they really, really killed it. So I was just happy to have them say yes. And then also happy to give them the opportunity to show some colors that maybe they hadn't had a chance to show yet in their careers. Hey, how you doing, Mo? This is Al McGee at yeticket.com. Um, and I watched the movie and I had some laughs and I had some ooh, ooh yeah. moments. But let's talk about the couple, James and Vanessa. They hear this news about a white police officer shooting a kid, but they sit around and say, well, what are we going to do? Did you get that? Did you put that question in their head because when that really happens in real life, many of us say that to ourselves. What can we do when we hear about a police officer killing a black person or a black kid? Is that where you got that from? Yes, uh, very much so. I think oftentimes these travesties take place and we find ourselves in a state of hopelessness and questioning what should we do and almost even more importantly, what can we do? And it feels like our options are limited. So a lot of this like was inspired by real moments that were happening in my life and in the world. And then trying to find a very heightened way to tell the story to still be entertaining and 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 um and dynamic. But really definitely the the core of it was very much 
a feeling that I found myself and I think that everybody on the Zoom, we've had like some stuff like this happens and it's like, what should I do? Because you, you feel so affected by it. You want to be able to do something. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. Uh, every time I hear that, uh, I always say, what can I do? What do I want to do? Well, thank you very much. I'm glad to see you today. Thank you. Glad to see you as well, brother. Thank you. Hi, Joe Monroe with Access to the Life. So, Mo, your decision to use satire is something that we haven't seen a lot in comedy in this space in a while. So can you talk about choosing that direction? And especially I loved in the opening scene how that seemed like one entire sequence and sort of the heightened excitement and we reach a point and the story continues on. So can you talk about using the point of view that you decided to use when creating this piece? Uh, thank you. I'm happy you asked me that too about the uh, satirical element. It felt to me the subject matter had been approached and there's been these conversations we've all been having collectively and we've seen other pieces of art, the film or publications and images that, that, that canvas the subject matter. But I felt like it had never been done in a way that could really allow it to not feel not not to spare, I don't want to I want to be careful how I phrase this because I don't want to say it's in a way that's like negative for anything that's been done already. But I just felt like there was an opportunity to deal with the subject matter in a way that didn't feel like it was like just too heavy-handed and soapboxy and serious. It was like, well, what if we can take this and maybe laugh at the absurdity of it all? And with that levity and with that satire, I think it makes us all more susceptible to being receptive if that makes sense. So you could disarm, I think, with some laughs, it allows people to lean in a little bit more and go on the journey. Because at the end of the day, as much as I want to talk about serious things, I also want to make a movie that was entertaining. I think the medium it, and, and at its best is when you have a full experience, one that includes laughs and tears and the woes and lean back lean forward sweat cry laugh all those things so going a satirical route felt like the greatest opportunity for me to touch on the subject matter in the most dynamic way possible and yes the whole opening was one long sequence i wanted to show how those dynamics i talk about like being able to laugh with this couple cry with this couple um um laugh with them and at them I wanted to see all that unfold in a very real time manner. So doing it in one continuous shot felt like the most appropriate way to showcase that. Hi, I'm Nancy Green with Film Critique. Hey, Nancy Green. Hi. And um, my question is, uh, for me watching this movie, it was actually very disturbing from the very beginning. Um, there's like a lot of different layers of tension, I think, especially in the performances. And I wanted to know, um, how, how did you determine to do that throughout the film, even during the lighter moments? Oh, that's a great question. Well, I felt like the um, lens in which the audience kind of sees the film through would have a great deal of impact on what the experience was for a said audience member. So like the tension and things of that, the characters kind of connect to the some of the traumas or the history that those characters are obviously carrying at the onset. And then there was a friction between them that as much as they were in the home together and they had like ostensibly a very beautiful light, like to your point, there's this constant tension at play. And I felt like once again, that was just an extension of, of me trying to articulate what many of our lives actually feel like where things are okay, on the surface and there are things going on out in the world that might not necessarily appear to be directly affecting us, but they are. And so even with the, the satirical elements and the levity, there is definitely this, uh, like this, the crux of it really does lie in the tension that they were experiencing before this moment. And then once the moment where the film picks up, it just adds, to a situation that was already brimming with all of those things. And just like the satire felt appropriate for me, like having all the tension kind of riding on a parallel track with it felt like a, a really dynamic experience for the audience and something that was an extension of how 
I personally have felt as a, you know, growing up as a, you know, as a black man in this country, there's like tension in almost everything that I've ever done that's connected to so many of those things that surely by the nature of my existence feels like. Right, right. Well, thank you. Thank you. It was a very good movie too. Thank you very so well much. Done. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Mel Katia Woods um, with Couple Soul Show in the Philadelphia Tribune. Okay. One of the things that I thought was um, interesting about this film is that we sometimes forget that the same people that, that not everybody that gets pulled over by the police lives in the hood or lives in a lower class neighborhood, that that scenario of you living next door, interacting, your children possibly playing with the person that is doing the oppression, um, this idea that if we live together, you know, we would respect each other more and we would understand is not necessarily true. Why was it important for you to show that, you know, to have this couple, this family be middle class, to be well to do? Because again, um, when we think of these interactions, we usually don't think that we think class, you know, will help elevate or reduce that. No, that's a really great question. I, and I appreciate uh the um thoughtfulness from you all too because i know i made a really nuanced film and i think for it to be fully appreciated it requires like these types of conversations and this thought and these are the things that i dreamt of when i was making the film so thank you for that and it, it's like the um i pull from my own life every one of these characters is inspired by myself and people in my life and one thing I discovered as I um, acquired what many would deem to be uh, success in my career as an artist, as an actor, primarily up until this point, is that it did not make me immune to certain things. And that realization for myself and other people, and not just people of color, but women as well, is like there are still things inherently prevalent that no matter how far you ascend, you will still encounter those things. In this film, that was something I wanted to show because I think oftentimes when certain interactions happen, people attribute it to a certain group of a certain social economic status and things of that nature. And I felt like picking a upper middle class, very successful, well-educated couple and, ha and showing that they too are affected by these things that are happening in the world and they are not immune to it because of money and status that that was a, a, a perspective that was missing. And I think it was something that needed to be added to the conversation. Hey, it's Rhonda. Um, I see that you've been directing for a minute, but this is your first feature length film. What made, well, talk about the transition. When did you know you wanted to direct and why did you choose for this to be your debut? Oh, man, that's a great question. You know, what's funny about that question about when I chose to direct, it's, it's, um, it's very much like when people ask me, when did you decide to act? At first I thought it was, in high school, then I kept thinking back and realized actually it was an elementary school, but high school was the first time it was it was really cognizant for me. And directing, the short answer is over the last 10 to 11 years, throughout my acting career, I'd almost been treating my acting career like film school. And I haven't used a lot of money I made as an actor buying equipment and making short films and making things that I would never show anyone. I shadowed, I gotta give a shout out to like Paris Barclay, who was the president of DJ, one of the most prolific directors in television, who was directing a show I was acting on called Pitch. He allowed me to shadow Stephen Boschko, rest in peace, who's deemed to be the godfather of television. And then getting to work with people like Lee Daniels and Jean-Marc Vallier, like these really incredible filmmakers that allowed me to show up on my off days when I was acting to just watch them and to have conversations with me. And, and so with that, I had been making these projects, short films and, and uh, some videos, commercials, and now I'm directing television as well. But when it came to my first feature with a lot of nothing, it's gonna sound dramatic, but that was a story I was gonna die if I couldn't tell it. 
like that story, this story, this film, these conversations, these characters that I pulled from my life that I felt like so many people in the world could connect to. It was just a story that I knew I had to tell. And I was the only person that could tell it because of the specificities of it. So it was like, that was always going to be the first film I made. Like, I'm going to continue to make movies. It's a really big part of my life now, but it had to be the first one because it was just so personal. It was just like exploding. I couldn't sleep. I wouldn't have been content. My life wouldn't be satisfied if I didn't make the film. Oh, thank you. You mentioned pitch. I love pitch. Thank you. Thank you. Mo, I want to follow up on the, uh, kind of on what you were talking about with Katya about. You, when, when you look at your your characters, you have these two couples and they're, the other couple is not middle class. In fact, in looking in, in, in the drama that you put between the two of them is more than the drama of this police shooting. So talk about the dynamics because you're saying a lot about class. You're saying a lot about status. You're saying a lot there. And uh, I found those characters really, uh, the interaction between them very, very interesting. Thank you. So I felt like the characters were all, once again, inspired by different people in my life and the conversations that are happening. And I also feel like there was a huge opportunity for me to showcase the fact that people of color are not like a monolithic group. There are so many varying points of views and desires and attitudes and intentions that just permeate out, permeate throughout the entire scope of our uh, of our of our people, you know, throughout the diaspora. So it was like with those different characters having very different desires and points of view, it kind of goes back into what I was saying to Nancy about with the tension. So it's like it just from a dramatic point of view of screenwriting and what we all kind of gravitate to when we press play on something, whether it's a reality show or you watching a boxing match or your favorite movie, it's the tension. It's the conflict. So the more um, disparate the points of view were there, I feel like that was the greatest chance at tension and conflict. And then the other parts of your question there was, I was kind of got enamored with this idea that although they had this cop kidnapped, right? There's all these problems in the world. They have this other giant problem with the cop that, that doesn't then just eradicate their own intrapersonal dynamics and conflict and tension. So then you have all these things kind of in a pot together as, as the fires is continuing to go up higher. Well, that fire was hot, dude. That was hot, <laughs> sizzling. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Hey, how you doing, Mo? Al McGee again here at whyticket.com. Yeah. Um, this is a question I have. Uh, and the reason, I'm, I'll tell you the reason why I'm asking this. Uh, I used to be a drug counselor, and uh, James told his wife, Vanessa, I'm seeing a therapist, but she didn't know that. But he said, the reason I'm seeing a therapist is because I'm caught up into your stuff. You make me react and things like that. And I saw that in many couples. They were always opposite or one uh, elevated another person to do something that they didn't want to do because they were in love with, with that person. Is that why you put that in, that he's seeing a therapist? And also, how important is therapy to you? Yeah, that's great, bro. Y'all get deep. I love it. I love it. Um, Thank the you. therapy concept and idea was rooted in my own curiosities around relationships right and and how much do we want the other person to grow in a relationship if they eventually grow at a rate that is detrimental to the relationship or does not include or make the other person feel comfortable about the other person's journey towards growth so when you think about him in his therapy mission there was a version where she could have been excited that he was finding uh, um, some truth and going deep within himself to solve things. But I feel her reaction was very much one that suggests that she felt left out. It's like, where do she fit into this? So it became less about his journey and more about how that journey um, pertained to her and their journey, which can be seen as separate things. And 
in terms of therapy being important, I think anything that anyone does in hopes of making them a better person and creating a better human experience for them, I think is an amazing thing, whether it's therapy, meditation, working out, like whatever that version is that allows a person to just to, to look inward and not try to seek external forces of validation or anything like that, but to really work and repair on themselves, I think is a wonderful thing. But there, I just felt like it was a, a interesting study, kind of like how do we feel about things that, the, that your partner does if it doesn't necessarily benefit or include you in a way that you see fit. Yeah, I saw a lot of that in, in, in my life and also in professional and non-professional uh, tears that I've been in. And uh, the other person did not want that other person to grow or the other person wants to keep that other person at the same way so they can control that person too. Right. And then that was too, yes, keeping them the same because they're, they're, there's, a, there's safety and familiarity. And so when somebody goes on this journey and begins to evolve, like often, like I grew up in the hood, I grew up in a very bad neighborhood, as unfortunately as many people uh, of color do you grow up in these certain environments and as I began to do things like read books that didn't come from school and just on my own deciding to read I remember how uncomfortable that made so many of my friends and people in my life this idea of changing because once I change and it's like well what does that do where do they fit into this new uh, variation of my life and I think in this particular thing one last thing I'll say about it is that it also was another secret. So James was keeping secrets and this was another secret that she was feeling that he wasn't being forthright and transparent, which she rightfully had issues and gripes with. Thank you very much. And this movie has a lot of layers to it. I really <laughs> enjoyed that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, Jill Monroe again. So you talked about how you felt like you would die if you didn't tell this particular story. So now that you've walked through that process, what is that feeling like? And also, did you learn anything about acting through the process of directing this and how you feel like your future projects will play out from this experience? Oh, uh, yeah, this experience was... Um... I'm a father of three kids now. I um, have a wife, a home. I grew up in South Central LA, never met my father. Like a lot of these crazy things in my journey, right? That are really like complicated, big things. I've traveled the world, been on television for like 20 plus, for television movies, like 20 plus years now at this point. And all of those things, were necessary for me to pull from to be able to make this movie because making movies is so difficult it's like everything works against you to make a movie everything works against you and it, what it showed me was just that like faith is such a i want to say undervalued understated underappreciated thing because there were so many moments where it was only faith that got me through to the next day of actually making the film. So I think it just taught me so much about faith, about perseverance and things that I'll keep with me for the rest of my life as a man, as a father and all these other areas of my life that and they're all challenging, but it's very rewarding and fruitful when you can persevere. And then in terms of like, as an actor, this cast was so incredible. And I got to watch everybody's process that led them to deliver those amazing performances. And I got to intimately observe and help guide and steer and watch them do things that I could then be like, oh, that's a smart approach. I'm going to take that and steal that and keep it in my back pocket. Even we just did a screening, uh, Film Independent did a screening, and I was having a conversation with Shamir Anderson and Alon, and Shamir was talking about this other movie he's doing, and and uh, he, he's his character was in the desert. Long story short, he said, no fake sweat was his mantra. So a lot of times when the actors are on a set, they have to sweat. You have the makeup person that comes over with a water bottle and sprays the water on them to look like sweat. But Shamir was like, no, no fake sweat. That's the mantra. 
I was like, oh, okay, next time I act again, I got to sweat. They better not come near me with that water bottle. But those are the kind of things, like I was around these great artists on that, Justin Hartley, Lex Scott Davis, Cleopatra Coleman, Alana Well, Shamir Anderson, they were all incredible and taught me a lot about the craft of acting, just from watching their processes and everything. They were so uh, gracious and sharing with me. Hi, Nancy again. Um, I wanted to know, can you talk about the contrast between the two cu couples and the stereotypes that a lot of people have um, in society about those types of people and um, how this movie sort of addresses that and sort of breaks those stereotypes down? Okay, so the contrast between the two couples were uh, interesting because you have the James and Vanessa couple who based on just the trappings of their lifestyle and what they did for a living suggest that they had basically accomplished and realized the American dream for the most part. Like they had great jobs, they have a great home, two nice cars, they look great and they have all of those things, but the love between them was broken. It was fractured and 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 what they had to come to realize that all those things really ultimately didn't matter. And in the line that James says in the movie where he'd done all this working and sacrificing, trying to run his rat race and make a uh, corporation, you know, whoever we work for it feel good to appease them, but really it amounted to a lot of nothing. And on the other side of it, you have this couple who was a little bit more free-spirited, more salt to the earth, not as uh, ex ostensibly educated in the same manner as James and Vanessa with Jamal and Candy, but they had a love between them and almost, almost like a purity to it that could easily be overlooked and discredited because they kind of were awkward. They moved at a rhythm that wasn't one that we were taught to operate in school. And we were going to school with candies and the crystals and things like that and sage and the universe. They didn't teach us that in school. So it was outside of the norm, which allowed Vanessa and James, or other people that would encounter those type of characters to immediately discredit them. But ultimately they were blessed in having that baby that they were able to bring into the world at the end of the film. And, and, and so between those two contrasts, like very different. Also, I think they were all similar in the fact that ultimately when it really, when the rubber hit the road and things got real, they all ended up wanting to be there for each other. And that was something that was important to me to showcase that even with all those differences, people had to change and acknowledge that nobody was all one thing. Nobody was all good. Nobody was all bad. Everybody had a little bit of everything in them and they could get over that and try to work towards what was the better, uh, the best possible scenario with all things considered. So they were very much different and contrasting it in a plethora of ways, but ultimately, we all had the same common goals of like survival and, and taking care of your tribe. Nice, nice. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Mo Kathy again. Um, let's talk a little bit about James's character. Um, prior, I worked in corporate America. I worked in finance, often being the only Black person, period, a, a person of color in the environment. And having to deal with passive aggressive things, you know what I mean? And then, you know, when you do have things like, you know, police violence and being in that work environment and, and looking at your white colleagues and that chatter and not being able to, to really say how you feel. I thought, you know, just, you know, when you see him at work, it's a very, it's not as easy as those of us, you know, who, who just get to be themselves. I think, talk a little bit why that's important to show to work life and how, you know, he slowly is losing his armor, so to say, because it, it is, you know, you get in the car, you drive to work and you say to yourself, all right, I'm going to go in here. I'm going to do what I got to do. And, you know, to make this money, to, to, to have my career goals, um, talk about that aspect of it, because I don't think people realize that it is like a 24-hour additional job navigating space where you are the 
minority, but you have to balance speaking up, speaking out towards your career goals, your financial goals, your that type of thing. Yeah, yeah. It, it's heavy. It's deep. It's it's um the James's character is one that existed in a constant state of falsehood. And that he wasn't able to be his authentic self at work because his authentic self was disrupted by the commentary that would be placed upon him and things that were directed to him, but he couldn't react. He didn't have the autonomy or the agency to be able to say, hey, that was disrespectful. I don't like that. I don't like the way that made me feel out of like, you know, the repercussions and the, the thought of not being able to climb up the ladder. So he had to shed so much of like the emotionality that will make him be who he is, which ultimately was for me, what leads to him doing what he does in the end of the film is because you just watch, it's like a, another ounce of pressure, another ounce of pressure, another ounce of pressure. And he never had the um, ability and the option or, or the permission, unfortunately, to really decompress and then to really process everything that he was feeling and experiencing. He had to be upright. He had to turn the other cheek. He had to just, okay, kind of just accept this, this treatment is what it is. And that's what comes with the, with the process. And I've never said this out loud. And I wrote this film obviously before this whole thing happened. And I'm hesitant to even say this, but I, I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't. I think about somebody like a Will Smith Oh, we've seen the one way for so long. He was perfect for so long. Everything about him was charismatic. He was smart. He's a hard worker. He was funny. He was the butt of so many jokes and all these things. And he's successful. And then he has that moment. It's like, whoa, who is this guy? And it's like, I don't think that guy that, you know, that did the, that act comes out of nowhere. I feel like it's probably been there, but it's been buried and suppressed. And maybe in the suppression of that, is what allowed it to become so big because it didn't get those releases, those incremental releases, like a lot of people are afforded. And so James, I think, was a character that just suppressed, suppressed, suppressed. And he didn't get that release ever. Those, those options weren't afforded because I even know in my own life, like I'm, 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 I'm never late, right? I'm never late. I try to work so hard. I do all these things because I don't feel like there's a margin for error for me. There's no room for error. I can't mess up. And I think James, as a part of what I bring from my life in the writing of James characters, he just constantly had this, this existence where he can't make a mistake. He can't be human. He has to be superhuman to even get close to where he see like his counterparts get to it. They don't even do the work. They just throw it on him. They don't have to do the work. He has to do the work or he will fail and he will never be anything of note. And that's, that's what led to him becoming the man he became. 100%. Thank you. Hey, it's Rhonda again. Hey, your beautiful wife, like Scott Davis, is in this. What was the hardest part of directing her? And what was the easiest part? Man, I just got emotional right now with you saying that. It's so crazy. Uh... Yeah, I'm, um, so my wife is amazing. And um, I never, it's like the, the as much as telling this story meant to me and as important as this film was, there was always like the real world um, complications of, of taking that much time out of my life. And what I primarily do to earn a living and take care of my family has been acting. And, and so it's like, all right, and I never forget like laying in the bed with my wife one morning, like in 2017 or 18. And she's just like, you know, if you're gonna make this movie, you just gotta just make it. And if you don't act for a little while, you don't do anything else, I'm gonna support you. I got you. Don't, don't even worry about it. So that kind of was always something that was like really profound and beautiful that she was willing to take that on. And in the process of making the film, the hardest thing about directing my wife and working with her in that capacity was my wife was really pregnant during the movie. My wife was really pregnant for real. And so having my wife work 
and have those emotional beats and like the water break scene. My wife was really pregnant and acting like she's having going into, uh, going into delivery prematurely. That was a stressful, emotional moment for real because she's really pregnant. I'm like, am I not only compromising the health and safety of my wife, but of my child, my son that's in there at that time. So that was like incredibly difficult. And then a pandemic happens on top of that. And we still like kind of in production. My wife is pregnant. So it was like, she just, so I just pulled a plug, like, you know, forget this whole thing, just pull the plug. So the, all that stuff. But then the best part about it is, you know, she is outside of being my wife being incredibly stunning and beautiful. She truly is a phenomenal actress. So just getting to work with her purely professionally and watch another artist that was able to just tap into such truth and realness and, and like just brought life to this stuff and grounded it too in a movie that's so absurd. Like she actually brought a lot of, even though her point of view seemed kind of out there, but her performance was actually very grounded and real and kind of centered. And there's this thing of being able to like hide, uh, uh, hide the truth in some of the candy, you know I mean? The character's name was Candy. And it's like, it's like those little things that she brought so it was was like was a true highlight and i'm happy too that a lot of people once now people are starting to see the film really love what she did with the work but she's just a phenomenal talent so it was an honor i got to work with her in that capacity and see it firsthand and then she linked it to this thing that i came up with mo thank you for your time today and congratulations on this terrific uh feature film debut buddy Thank you, man, so much. Thank you. I appreciate this. Absolutely. On behalf of the world's largest group of Black film and TV critics, we thank you for watching this edition of Africa Roundtables. Have a great day.